before we get into Scripture, and be seated as well, Dan, you bet. <laughs> before we get into uh, our Scripture for tonight, I want to introduce us uh, a little bit into this series. One of the things that I have loved about this series uh, that we've been moving through in the season of Lent is that it really helps to give us a lens or a way of looking at some of those big questions of faith in ways that I think are, are encouraging and helpful. So that when we come to questions, not only the ones that we've been uh, tackling here in our Lenten season, but when we come to questions that uh, have uh, that wrestling with doubt, things like that, uh, it's our hope that we can we, we have a, a way, some lenses, some tools to to dig a little deeper into what uh, what we can do, how can we respond, how can we uh, discern where God might be moving within those questions. So we come to questions that we we have that can't be answered for certain, right? These big questions that we've been wrestling with through our Lenten season, questions like evil and suffering from last week, or, or questions like this week's, right? What happens after you die? Uh, one of our hopes for this series is that it gives us some tools to uh, look at these questions through a lens of faith. So when we dig into questions about uh, things like what happens after we die, the most immediate and easiest answer is we don't know, right? But, that doesn't mean that, that, that that's all there is to say about it. If you remember Pastor Aaron's message from a couple weeks ago about Scripture, uh, this is a, a place where we can start, and I think her, uh, some of the tools that she gave us in that message were, were really wonderful practices for engaging these questions. Uh, so one of the things that she lifted up was that with our questions of faith or struggles of doubt, one of the first places that we go, or the first place that we go, is to Jesus. And we look in, in the Gospels, the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that start our New Testament. And we hear in these four accounts the story of Jesus. And so we hear, uh, when we have these questions, we have things that we are wondering about, we can go and we can see what Jesus would say about such things. So, our first reading for tonight is John 14. And we hear what's often called Jesus' final discourse. It's the last time He's with His disciples, uh, before He's arrested. And John tells of these conversations that happen in the midst of the disciples' struggle, in the midst of their anxiety, their doubts and wonderings about what comes next. Jesus has been saying a lot of things about being arrested and crucified, and they're starting to feel like that is coming near. And so in the, into that anxiety, Jesus speaks this word of promise. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. This is a time where Jesus is encouraging his disciples by reminding them to trust who He is and trust what He is doing. It's a reminder that in whatever it looks like, whatever is next, we can be assured that Jesus has already been there. That Jesus is already there, right? Where I come... Can we go back to the John? Just the previous slide there. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. It's this verse, these, these, this section uh, of John's Gospel where the promise of Jesus' presence is with us no matter where we may be, no matter where we may go, no matter what may happen, that because we belong to Jesus, we can be assured that the presence of Jesus is always with us. 
so we look back to, to other scriptures, like our next one from the prophet Isaiah. Right? Isaiah is talking about Mount Zion, where the temple was in Jerusalem in Isaiah's day. And there's a word that repeats a few times as uh, we read through this. So I want you to see if you can catch it uh, as we read through this. So this is Isaiah 25, 6 through 8. It says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Did you catch it? All. Right? We see the word all repeat itself five times in these three verses. That the feast is for all people. That the shroud that covers everyone is cast over all peoples. That God wipes away the tears from all faces. That our disgrace is taken away from all the earth. That death is swallowed up forever. There's an all-encompassingness to this action of God. Right? So after we ask what the Gospels say about a topic, what the broader Scriptures say about a topic, we can see that Scripture tells us that whatever may come next, whatever that may be, it will be somewhere where Jesus has already been, Jesus has already gone, and will draw us to Him. And it's for all people. It's totally covering all peoples, all places, all nations, and so on. So after we see what the Scriptures say about a topic, we can look to our tradition. Right? What does our tradition say as we discern these kinds of questions? For us as Lutherans, we can look back and see what Martin Luther had to say about God's kingdom. What Martin Luther had to say about what the kingdom that is beyond our earthly kingdom is about. And so, when Jesus is teaching His disciples how to pray, when He's teaching them the Lord's Prayer, part of that prayer is, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's one of the ways that Jesus teaches us to pray. And Martin Luther dives into this in his small catechism. He expands on these a little more. He teaches, and, and in his explanation of this part about God's kingdom When we pray for God's kingdom to come, God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, he writes this. He says, This comes about whenever God gives us the Holy Spirit, so that through the Holy Spirit's grace we believe God's holy word and live godly lives here in time and hereafter in eternity. It's connected to how we are, how we live here And now, that when we talk about the kingdom of God, it's not this place far away. It's not the the, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away or uh, anything. It's not this distant kind of reality, but rather it's right here and now. We have a lot of different parts of Scripture, a lot of different parts of our tradition that speak of this vision. And for so many, it's not about us escaping earth to be somewhere else. But it's about being in union with God, connected to God in the presence of God and about the kingdom of God being realized here on earth. So we look at what Scripture has to say about something. We look into our tradition. What does our tradition have to say as we're discerning through these questions? And then we ask, what does our human experience say? What does our our lived experience as people, as humans, how does that inform what we're struggling with? This could be both stories that we've experienced or a a faith story we've heard others share times where, where God has met us in 
our questions, our prayers, our struggles. Uh, yesterday in our staff meeting, our office administrator, Sue Ann, uh, shared a story with us, and I, I asked her if I could share it here uh, with you all, and she gave me the okay. She said, as long as I don't have to share it, <laughs> you can feel free to do that, she said, as she, she laughed a little bit. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Sue Ann's mom passed away last Friday. And so we certainly hold her family in, in prayer uh, as they continue to walk this, this journey of grief. But Sue Ann told this story uh, at our staff meeting yesterday that was so powerful. As her mom was nearing the end of her life, the chaplain had come in and read Psalm 23 with them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He continues on, but after the chaplain had finished reading, they asked, what part sticks out to you? And though her mom was in that gray area between life and death, her answer came through loud and clear, and she said, the stillness. The stillness. Later on, her mom started describing things that she was seeing. Uh, they asked her what God looked like. If she could see God, what God looked like. She reported that God looked fashionable and pretty. <laughs> And I love how specific that description is, right? It's not something we hear God described as very often, but the specificity of that description, that those were the immediate words that came to mind. Later on in the day, she asked her, her brother Erling, who's still... Uh, with us still alive, she asked her brother Erling to roll her into her mom and dad's arms. She said, Erling, roll me into dad's arms. Roll me into mom's arms. It's a powerful testament, a testimony to the experiences that we have in those in-between spaces. There's a number of stories that are out there. A, a number of people have these stories that are, are similar in theme, but of course the details of each are a little different. It's a powerful testimony to, to something that happens as we near death, even if it can't be fully explained. Again, it leads us toward union with God and toward union with those who have gone before us. And so whatever answers we may want, however badly we may want them, we hold all these testimonies in faith, hope, and love, knowing that we can trust God to be exactly who God says He is. And when we look to Scripture and tradition and experience, when we use these lenses to look at this question of what happens after. Right? In faith, some of the things that we start to hear, the things that come up as we discern are, is that Jesus has already been there. Wherever it is, Jesus is already there. Drawing us to Him. That is for all people as the promise of the prophet Isaiah says. And that it's about union with God and union with those who have gone before in the whole communion of saints. It's much more about building God's kingdom here on earth than it is about escaping away to some other sort of reality, some other place about realizing God's kingdom here and now in the love, faith, and hope that we are able to share together. These are the things that we 
begin to see take shape as we discern these questions, as we use these lenses to try to see where God might be moving in our midst and how we can follow in faith. And it's for these things and for the conversation, testimony, stories of others that we can give thanks be to God. Amen.